Hi, I'm Mike Gerhauser. On behalf of the other elders and all who gather here, I want to say welcome to Resurgence Church. We are glad that you found us. Now, whether this is your first time joining us or you meet with us regularly, we pray that the message that you're about to hear would encourage you, would edify you in your faith, and would bring glory to God. We also want to encourage you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Don't forget to hit that bell so that you get notifications. And if you want to learn any more about us, you can go to our website at rsgchurch.com. There you can listen to past messages, you can give online, you can check our calendar of events, and you can see our statement of faith. Thank you again for joining us. Pray that you are blessed by the preaching of the word this morning. God bless you. Good morning. Okay, today's reading is from Matthew 2, 1 to 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes people, he inquired of them, where is the Christ to be born? They told him in Bethlehem of Judah. For so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are no least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler, well, my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise people secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, found him bring me word that i too may come and worship him after listening to the king they went on their way and behold the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was so the star they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy and going into the house they saw the child with Mary his mother and they fell down and worshiped him then opening their treasures they offered him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod they departed to their own country another way amen Um, Jesus, King, Christ, and Shepherd is the title, but let's pray before we get into it. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this Christmas day and, uh, and pray that you would just bless the time that we have gathered together here, that you would anoint our ears to hear the truth that you have prepared for us, Lord, that you would be magnified and glorified in this place and in the lives of every person who hears and believes. I praise you and thank you for your miraculous work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so this morning, uh, as we celebrate, we, we celebrate the birth of our Savior, right? And, and I, you know, you say that and I say, just let that sink in for a minute. And we celebrate the birth of a Savior, one who saved us. And we say, well, saved us from what? Well, from the wrath of God that was our due, because of our sins, right? We have to, we talked about that last week. We have to get that bad news before we can appreciate the good news that every one of us deserves death. And, and even on the days when we're at our best behavior, we're on our best behavior, we have the rebellion of Adam stored up in our hearts, don't we? But God in his mercy sent a savior. And, uh, and again, we talked about this last week, right? Jesus, who was born God with us to save us from our sins. And that's one of those truths that, you know, we can, we can say it again and again to ourselves and it hits deeper. I think every time we understand it, right? Uh, you know, when we're first saved, we hear that truth that, that God out of his own mercy and goodness saved us from our sins by the death of Jesus Christ. And we're, we're humbled. And we're amazed that uh, that uh, that we could that God would do that. And we say, how could we ever love God anymore for all that he's done? Right. We have that first zeal for the Lord and we how could we be any more grateful? But then we walk with the Lord for a time. Right? If you've walked with the Lord for any amount of time and 
And I think as we walk with the Lord, we see more and more what he's done for us. We see more and more how he's changed us, how he's conformed us to the likeness of a son. But I think we also see at the same time how we fall short, clearer and clearer. They, they, they seem to come in clarity in, in equal measure, right? That we see how much we've been saved from and how far short we continue to fall. And we think, how could I love God? any more than this, the grace and kindness, the impossible power of it. And we're even more amazed than before that a God who is so big and so mighty would humble himself and pour his love out on us. Amen. And this morning we're picking up where we left off there in the book of Matthew. We're looking at this Jesus, this, this God with us who saved us from our sins. And we're going to look at three titles applied to him in this next portion of scripture, Jesus, the King, the Christ, and the shepherd. And so first we look at Jesus, the king. And the scripture tells us, as Karen read, that wise men from the east came to Jerusalem because they had seen a star in the heavens. And they had understood this star to be a herald and a sign that there was a new king born to rule over the Jews. And we have that song, you know, we three kings, right? But they weren't really kings. The, the ESV translates it as wise men from the East. The Greek word used is magos, where we get the word magi from. And, uh, and we don't know if there were actually even three. We, we make up that three. Probably comes from the, the gifts that they gave, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh, that there were three gifts. Uh, but magos or magos was the name given by the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians uh, and others to the wise men or the teachers or the priests, physicians, the astrologers, those, those soothsayers, the seers, etc., the sorcerers. And these uh, magos, these, these wise men, they interpret a sign in the sky and they travel to Israel to find this one whose birth was so significant that it moved the whole heavens, right? Herod who was a client king of, of Rome. He wasn't so enthusiastic when the wise men showed up, right? Asking to see the one who would be born king of the Jews. In particular, because that was his title, king of the Jews. Herod was descended from Esau. He was an Edomite, not technically Jewish, all right? But there had been a lot of intermarriage between the Jews and the Edomites over the years. And so he did publicly identify as a Jew, but didn't have the best record for keeping the Jewish law. Had a, had a record for, for being quite cruel, actually. Back in 41 BC, um, Herod was named governor of Galilee. And when Israel came into conflict with Rome, Herod actually took Rome's side in it betraying his own people. And he was then named King of the Jews. That was the official title, King of the Jews by the Roman Senate. They are the ones that gave him that title. And so by the time the wise men show up here following the star, Herod had been ruling as King of the Jews for more than 30 years. And, and so jealous was he of any competition that after he realizes he's been tricked by the wise men, when they depart by another route, he orders every male child in Bethlehem, two years old and younger, to be murdered. That's known now as the slaughter of the innocents. We know, of course, Jesus uh, escapes that because Joseph is warned in a dream by the angels. And so he takes his family down to Egypt until the time that Herod has died and they return to Israel. But it is interesting that the birth of the true king of Israel, the birth that angels announce by saying, peace on earth is met with immediate bloodshed, a horrendous kind of bloodshed. But even in that, we say, well, how could God do something like that? And I don't know why God does those things, but I know that he does, and I know that he's foretold them. I'm reminded of Psalm 2, which asks, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? We know they're going to rage at the birth of the king. He says, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Of course, the kings of the world and the powers of this world will fight against whatever threatens their power. But the true word of God, Jesus, is born a king. Amen. Not a political power like the people expected, but a power that rules and reigns over the entire world. Not a king of the Jews only, but a king of the universe, a king over creation, a king of kings and a lord of lords. Jesus is called king of the Jews, only on two occasions, actually, in scripture. More than two times, but on two occasions. Here at his birth, 
and then again at his death. The soldiers who mock Jesus, they call him by this title. Pilate refers to him several times as the king of the Jews. He even has that name, that title placed on the placard that he posts on the cross when Jesus is crucified. And it's interesting that in both, on both occasions, at his birth and his death, it's only the Gentiles who use that title. Showing how scripture is again fulfilled that he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But I want to focus on the, uh, on the conversation that Pilate has with Jesus just before his crucifixion. Now, all four Gospels record Pilate asking Jesus at the end, before his death, are you the king of the Jews? And, and Jesus basically says, yeah, you say so. You said it, right? The Gospel of John develops the discourse just a little bit further. Jesus claims to be a king. He says, you have said so. You say it is so. In John 18, he then says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom right? Who has kingdoms? Kings, right? So Jesus is claiming that. People try to be all creative with it. Well, he didn't exactly say it. He's saying it, okay? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. And then Pilate says to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. There, church, there is no truth apart from Jesus Christ. There is no truth outside of Jesus Christ. Pilate then asks, what is truth? Now, really, he should have asked, who is truth? And he would have seen it standing right, right in front of him, right? But he doesn't see it. He couldn't see it. Now, if you remember, Pilate then goes out to the people and he says that he finds no guilt in Jesus. He says, I, I find nothing wrong with him. But since it's the Passover, there is a custom that a prisoner is released. And so Pilate asks the people, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And of course, you all know the story. The people cry out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, interestingly, I think uh, maybe Carl had mentioned this in a passage, uh, a message in the past. Barabbas, Bar Abba. It literally means son of the father. Son of the father. So it is that the full measure of the sin of the people must be accomplished. And the true son of the father is sent to death while a counterfeit is released. And the true king of the Jews is crucified while the kings of the earth continue to rule. And still today, much of the world has rejected this king. And we see the fruits of this rebellion as the world lives out the saying that closes the book of Judges. If you remember, at the end of Judges, it says, In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And if you read through the end of Judges, those aren't good things that they're doing that they see as right. And is that not the world that we live in today? When there is no king, the people will do what seems right in their own eyes. But friends, I could tell you confidently that there is a king. There is a king and his name is Jesus. And we have his word. We have his word to tell us what is right in his eyes. So we don't have to worry about what looks right in our eyes. But many have missed it or outright rejected it. Certainly many of the Jews in Jesus's day did, right? And part of the reason that so many of them missed who Jesus really was, was because they were looking for a Messiah who would rule an earthly kingdom. The Magi come and ask, where is he who was born king of the Jews? But when Herod assembles the chief priests and the scribes of the people in verse four, look what he asks. He asks where the Christ is to be born. He doesn't ask where the king of the Jews will be born. But you see, he understands the messianic significance of the Magi's question and perhaps even of the star. But his later actions reveal that he misunderstood the role of the Christ. Now that word Christ, you probably know, means anointed, right? The Hebrew equivalent is the word Messiah. Um, in Hebrew, Mashiach. Both mean anointed. And the word in the Hebrew actually shows up in several other places in the Old Testament. This, this is surprising to people sometimes that that word Mashiach shows up in the Hebrew when it isn't talking about Jesus. It isn't talking about the future uh, Messiah. For example, the word shows up all the way back in Leviticus. 
just talking about the priests. Uh, it shows up in 1 Samuel when David refuses to kill Saul. If you remember, he has an opportunity to kill Saul a couple times. And he says, he says uh, God forbid that I, I raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. That word anointed in the Hebrew is Messiah. And the root, uh, a root of the word, meaning to anoint, is used when Samuel finds David. Remember, he goes through all the sons of Jesse. First one, he says, oh, this must be the guy. God says, no, you're looking at the external. And he gets all the way to, he says, you have no more? And he says, well, there's, there's David out in the field, you know. And when he anoints, that word anoint is the same root as Messiah. And uh, the process of anointing, it was, it was a physically, it was pouring or smearing some kind of an oil on a person. And, and why they did that, it was an outward symbol. It was an outward symbol that the spirit of God was with this person, that this person was consecrated and set apart for purposes of God and was empowered by his spirit to carry out some holy function. It was a way of showing God's decision, God's selection, his choice, for example, of a king or a prophet or a priest, all were anointed in the Old Testament. It was used to consecrate or set aside something and mark it for a holy use. And when Jesus begins his earthly ministry in Luke 4, he goes to a synagogue. He takes the scroll from Isaiah. If you remember, he reads from chapter 61 saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has, what? Anointed me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus was anointed to do these things. He says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It is done. And many of the Jews in Jesus' day were expecting a political hero. Same way Herod was expecting. He thought he was going to have a political rival. They were looking for another king who would deliver them like the kings of the past. When God anointed them, but as with all the fulfillments that we see in Jesus, the truest work of Jesus is the spiritual and the eternal work, right? Yes, he addresses the physical. I don't mean to say that it's all, you know, all physical and no, uh, all spiritual and no physical. He still addresses the physical, but listen, the truest work is the work of regeneration, the work of redemption, the work of justification and sanctification, right? I believe in the second coming. It will be consummated completely in the physical, right? But now we have that salvation. We have that eternal life in the, in the spiritual. Most of the people, though, I think like today still, just wanted an earthly king. Give us a king. The physical, temporal victory. And when Jesus enters Jerusalem a week before his crucifixion, they thought they had that, right? Luke 19 37 and 38 says, as he was drawing near, known as the triumphal entry, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. They thought this Messiah would be an earthly king. The disciples think it too. Right? All the way through, even, even uh, in Acts 1 6, after Jesus has been resurrected, but before he ascends, his disciples say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They want the earthly kingdom restored. That was the expectation for the Messiah. And many believe Jesus was the Messiah, but they didn't understand the role and the work of the Messiah. We have the benefit, of course, of looking back, right? We have hindsight. We could see back and see all that Christ did. We have the, the benefit of God's word making things clear to us. And so we see, as Jesus said when he was speaking to Pontius Pilate, that his kingdom is not of this world. But he was anointed. He was chosen by God, a spotless lamb, to pay for the sins of the world. And we see Jesus, we actually see Jesus literally anointed a few times um, in his, in his ministry, uh, on his head and his feet in preparation for his burial, he says. But there's also a, a sort of anointing that happens when he's baptized, right? This is a, an anointing moment. At that baptism, the spirit out of heaven, the spirit comes out of heaven and rests upon him, it says, like a dove, right? And what is the purpose of anointing? It's to show God's choice 
to indicate that the person was set aside or sanctified for a holy purpose. Is that not what happens there, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all record a voice coming from heaven at Jesus's baptism saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. He's, he's selecting him. So this is him anointing him. Again, at the transfiguration, we have that voice say, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Clearly, Jesus was anointed in the spirit of God in every way while he walked on the earth and ministered here. But he was also, as we said, literally anointed with oil. Uh, scholars debate how many times exactly, because there are three instances recorded in the scripture, and there are a lot of similarities between them, but there's a lot of differences between them as well. So two of them happen at Simon's house, but one Simon the leper, one Simon a Pharisee. So very likely, I think, personally, I think three different occasions. Um, the first recorded in Luke 7 happens at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. All right. At the beginning of the, of the public ministry at the home of a Pharisee named Simon. If you remember this instance, a sinful woman comes up behind Jesus while he's reclining at the table. They used to, they used to lay at the table on their elbow with their, their feet out behind them. That's how she got, she's not like under the table. It would be weird in the Western world, right? But the way they, they reclined at the table, she had access to his feet and she's crying. She comes up to him crying and she wets his feet with her tears and, and wipes it with her hair. And then it says that she anoints his feet with an ointment and Jesus turns and forgives her sins. The next happens, uh, the next two um, anointings happen just before his death. First, just before the triumphal entry recorded in John 12. In this case, it's Mary, Mary, the, the, the sister of Lazarus, who takes an expensive ointment made from pure nard or spike nard, your translation might say, and anoints Jesus' feet with it. And she also wipes his feet with her hair. I guess that was the thing to do if you had hair. I don't know. Um, Jesus even says at that point that this anointing was done for the day of his burial, which happens just a week later. The third time scripture records an actual anointing of Jesus is in both Matthew and Mark. And it happens again at Bethany, the same place. The second one happens. And this time he's at the house of Simon, the leper, and a woman comes with an alabaster flask and she pours it on his head, anointing his head. Again, he says for his burial. And, and these are just external signs of the spiritual truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Mashiach, the anointed one who was marked and set aside for a purpose. And we talked about that purpose last week, right? To save his people from their sins. And finally, when the priests and scribes answer Herod's question about where this Christ was to be born, they quote from Micah 5, 2, which says, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And so we see already the king, we see the anointed one, the Christ, and now we see the shepherd. This ruler was to be a shepherd king. And that, that phrase might sound familiar, the shepherd king, because we talk about David often as the shepherd king, right? But David, we, we know, was a type of, he was a type and picture of the Christ, the true shepherd king to come. And God uses uh, the imagery of sheep and shepherds throughout the Old Testament. A really interesting study to look at all the, the imagery surrounding shepherds and, and sheep, uh, especially talking about those who are given charge over people. God refers to them as shepherds. The good ruler, the good shepherd, would care for the people, right? It would ensure, he would ensure their safety, would bring them in and out, figuratively speaking, to good pasture. But Ezekiel 34, God speaks out against the wicked shepherds of Israel. He says, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you ruled them. And in that rebuke, criticizing them for what they haven't done, we hear the true heart of God for what the good shepherd ought to do, right? The good shepherd ought to feed the sheep ought to strengthen the weak, heal the sick, bind up the injured, bring back those who stray, seek the lost, and rule with meekness and gentleness. Is there any better description of Jesus Christ than that? 
In John 10, 11, I'm going to read a, a bit of a section here from John 10, verses 11 to 18. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, right? He does all those things, that, that the, the very things that these guys are criticized for not doing. And Jesus does every one of them. Strengthens the weak, heals the sick, binds up the injured. Jesus says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a, who, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. See, Jesus is the shepherd who seeks the lost and binds up the broken, who feeds the sheep and gathers them into one flock, the one who leads with his gentle voice and lays down his own life to save ours. Amen. He is the true shepherd king, anointed and set apart for our deliverance. The passage that we started with this morning from Matthew 2, can I come to a close here? It ends with the wise men finding Jesus, right? I love, I love what it says. It says, when they find him, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Those are redundant, right? rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. How else can you rejoice exceedingly other than with great joy? And church, if you've come to the place where Jesus is, my prayer that is that this Christmas you also may rejoice exceedingly with great joy, knowing that he came to be your king. He came anointed by the Father to preach good news, to bind up the broken, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to shepherd his people in love, and to lay down his life for you. It says the wise men fell down and worshipped him and opened their treasures to him. What a beautiful picture, right? And, and church, what treasure has God given you that you can open before him and spend in the worship of our king? We could look very practically at this. Is it, is it time? Has God given you a treasure of time? Has he given you a listening ear? Maybe something as simple as a, a car that you've been blessed with, that you can use to, to bring groceries to somebody who's, who's shut in or sick, right? That there are so many treasures that God has given us that we can spend in worship of our King. We know that whatever we do to the least of these, his brethren, we do unto Jesus himself. Amen. But listen, it's not just a social gospel. This isn't just, Hey, Jesus loves you. Now go be nice to people, right? Because ultimately all that God has given to us are treasures that we could spend in worship of Jesus. But the greatest treasure is Jesus himself, right? That's the treasure that you have been given. You've been given Christ. And I just want to close with Jesus's words this morning in Matthew 10, 7, right? Jesus is sending his disciples out here, okay? Just as you are sent out this morning. And, and unless, listen, I know you guys probably have different plans for Christmas, but unless every single person in your family is a born again believer, each of us are going to a mission field today, are we not? And this is what Jesus says as he sends his disciples out to a mission field. He says, as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. I pray that you all have a, a blessed and Merry Christmas and uh, we get to worship the one who is the true King, Messiah and Shepherd. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus is all of this and more. I thank you, Lord, that you have been so much more faithful than we could ever be. So much more faithful than we deserve in your forgiveness in staying with us, Lord not leaving us, not abandoning us when the world would quickly run. I thank you, Lord, for saving me. I thank you for the church that you have gathered to yourself. And Lord, this day and every day, 
We thank you for Jesus and for all that you accomplished through him. I pray, Lord, for this body, for all, every ear that would hear, that they would be blessed, that they would know the true treasure and gift that is in Christ. In his perfect and wonderful name we pray. Amen.